Hello friends, Steve from Southern Illinois again. Managed to make it two weeks in a row. It's a little bit warmer down here this week. Fall is almost complete. The uh, Most of the trees that are leaves that are going to fall are off. Haven't been able to harvest many of them this year. Um, my energy levels have been so low that uh, raking leaves has not been feasible. I use them to uh, mulch my garden and my flower beds during the winter so weeds don't grow, but I guess next summer I will have to find energy for weeding. <clears throat> he said, she said. Have you ever been caught in a web of he said, she said? A situation where two people that you want to love, respect, trust, have very different stories that they're telling about an event, about circumstances, and you're left trying to decipher who's telling the truth, who understands what's going on, who's delusional. Is one right? The other wrong? Do both have half-truths? Uh, does it matter? Or are both of them wrong? You know, situations like this are really, really problematic. And if you haven't encountered one yet in your life, well, you've got an experience coming. Let's just put it that way, okay? I remember once, um, uh, this was oh, more than 20 years ago, my children were still small and Vivian and I decided to go to, on a date. Um, we tend to be a real, tended to be a really close family and most of the time we took our children with us when we went out to eat or when we went places. But this evening we decided that we wanted it just to be mommy daddy time. So, we hired a babysitter, a high school girl, the daughter of a, of a friend, um, someone that we felt close to, that we had confidence in. And uh, as a part of her instructions, Vivian reminded the girl that um, she was not to have friends over, especially boys, but no friends in the house. We were inviting her into our home, but not all of her circle of friends. Well, we went and had a wonderful evening and came home. And the next day, Vivian was talking to Terrell, our daughter. And Terrell said, Mommy, she had a boy over. And they were doing things in the living room that made me really uncomfortable. I just, I just stayed away. Well, that got Vivian's attention and, you know, uh, perked things up and she started investigating because she wanted to know whether she could trust this girl or not to do future babysitting. Well, the girl denied everything. Absolutely. No, I didn't have any boys over. So Vivian went back to Terrell and Terrell said, yes, she did. And so there Vivian was caught on the horns of he said, well, she said, she said, two differing stories. And when she called the mother of the, the girl involved to talk about it, the mother was incensed. How can you not trust my daughter? She's a teenager. She's trustworthy. Why are you taking the 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 taking the side of a young child who, you know, they're not reliable. And so you had the two mothers each side with their daughter, each choosing to trust in who they identified with. And isn't that how we make our decisions? Now, this was a minor issue, but it still left our friendship with this 
raw spot, this discomfort. Now, I've had relationships that completely broke apart in situations like this where the difference of stories was so radical or involved something so important that, well, trust couldn't be reestablished. And it leaves the, the whole question hanging. How do you resolve relationships when situations like this develop? I think God is, well, I don't think, I know that God is facing a similar situation. Remember, sin did not originate here on this earth. The Bible, well, Isaiah and uh, Ezekiel, Isaiah chapter 14 and Ezekiel chapter 28, describe the beginning of sin in someone who was close to God, who was, who was right in his presence, but who wanted more, who wanted to be God. Sin started in heaven. And Revelation 12 speaks of war breaking out in heaven and, and Satan and one third of the heavenly beings, the angels, being exiled from heaven as a result of the war. The temptation of Eve in the garden was just humans introduction to a war that was already going on throughout the universe. Paul, in his letter, both letters both to the Colossians and to the Ephesians, talks about Jesus reconciling not just humans, not just this world, but heaven. Now, many theologians take the position that there is no sin in heaven. There never was sin in heaven. That, that heaven is perfect. Well, I don't see that as being a biblical, biblical stance. If sin started in heaven, then God is dealing with a pandemic, a universal problem. All we see is the element that has to deal with our In essence, God is dealing with a pandemic, just like COVID, because sin is a self-perpetuating condition, just like a virus. When children are abused, it changes their brain anatomy. It changes their, bio, their genetic structure. It generates a whole host of physical and behavioral consequences and tendencies that have impact their health and their lives for the rest of their life and can even be passed on to their children. Now, if this is new information to you, if this, is, this sounds strange and weird, just research adverse childhood experiences and their impact on health. But sin is more than a disease. It's a pandemic of dis trust. Distrust in God, distrust in other humans. How do you resolve such a crisis? Well, COVID is a prime example of how we try to resolve it, okay? Leaders have tried, well, let's think here. They've tried propaganda, okay? They've tried shame. They've tried fear, mandates, incentives, threats. They've enacted laws. They've closed borders. They've shut down transportation. Some countries have involved martial law. And all of these efforts have helped to curb the spread of the virus to some degree. None of them, even the most draconian, have prevented it from spreading. But none of them have even touched the pandemic of distrust 
that has swept around the world during the COVID pandemic, okay? In fact, the very efforts that we were making to, to protect the public, the public health efforts have actually magnified the distrust that people have in government, in each other, in authorities. It doesn't matter if we're vaxxers or anti-vaxxers. Republicans or Democrats here in the U.S., maskers or anti-maskers, trust and respect have dropped to new lows, at least from my, from my perspective, during my lifetime, okay? Our confidence in leadership, our trust in the people around us, our respect for them, uh, is shattered. How do we restore this? Well, how did God deal with the sin pandemic? If you want to look at his first steps, read Genesis chapter 3, okay? But today I want to focus on his end game, how he finishes it off. Now, in between the beginning and the end, we have a critical element, and that is Christ's, second, Christ's first coming, his first advent, and what he did then. And I'm not trying to minimize that. But that's only one element in what God has been doing to try to resolve this pandemic of sin. So, Revelation um, chapter 20 uh, tells the end game. Now, theologians have multiple interpretations for this passage, and I'm not going to go through and try to, he said, she said, and did, did no, all I'm going to do is share what I am most familiar with and what makes the most sense to me, okay? First, context. In chapter 19, we have a picture of Christ's second coming and then an overview of what follows, okay? So, chapter 20 begins with Christ's second coming. It's what happens afterwards. So let's just walk through this um, section by section. And grab your Bible and, and, you know, the nice thing about video is you can hit the stop button or the pause button and read for yourself. Okay? So, Revelation chapter 20 verses 1 through 3. This, this section of the chapter describes what happens to Satan. He is bound. He is cast into a bottomless pit in the imagery that's used in Revelation. And he's bound there so that he cannot tempt anyone. He cannot tempt anyone. Which means there are new, no humans around. He is not with the wicked. He is not reigning over anybody. He is bound. Verses 4 through 6 describe what happens to the righteous, those who are saved. They live and reign with Christ for a thousand years. Now Satan is bound for a thousand years and the righteous reign for a thousand years. The simplest uh, exposition is that these two thousand year periods are the same. Okay. Um, and we know from Paul's writings that the righteous resurrection of the righteous occurs when Jesus comes. Paul very clearly talks about Christ coming in the clouds, a loud shout, the sound of the trumpet, and the righteous dead rising and we who are living joining them to meet Christ in the air. And Christ said that he would come back and take us to be where he is. So my understanding is that the righteous spend this thousand years with Christ where he is right now, what we term heaven. But this is the first time that we're told that the unrighteous are not resurrected at the same time as the righteous. 
Here we have two resurrections, a thousand years apart. Christ's coming is at the beginning of the thousand years. Okay? And at the end of the thousand years, the unrighteous are resurrected. Which means that during that time period, they're dead. Verses 7 through 10 happens at the end of the thousand years. Satan is released. The unrighteous are resurrected. And he motivates them to try to attack. Let's term the camp of the saints and the holy city, which is a, a euphemism in the Bible for Jerusalem. This is Satan's last stand, his last gasp, his last effort to wrest control of the universe from God. Verses 11 through 15, um, I've heard described as the white throne judgment, the final judgment, when everything is brought to a close and those who have rejected God's offer of salvation are annihilated. This is where the fire comes in. This is the only place where the fire comes in. Uh, and death is annihilated along with everything else. So what does the millennium, which we've been describing here, this thousand year time period, what does this have to do with resolving the sin pandemic? Christ died on the cross. He's already returned. What's all this happening? Why is this necessary? Well, Paul told the Corinthians that they would be involved, the righteous would be involved in judging both the world and angels. And this is the only other place in the Bible where you find reference to the saints judging. So something is happening in this thousand years that involves judging the world and angels. Doubt and distrust are extremely difficult to eradicate. Passing judgment on people that we think deserve judgment, we can do that pretty easy. In fact, uh, we, we jump at the chance, don't we? But when those who are judged are people that we identify with us, that we think are good, that we think are innocent, wow, then we start to get angry, okay? And when people we absolutely do not trust, do not identify, think are evil, are exonerated, well, just look what's happened in the United States in the, in the last few years when police officers have been exonerated when the media and public opinion disagreed. This is what I'm talking about, the pandemic of distrust. Okay, and this is what God has to deal with if he wants to preserve our free will. And that's the big if here, okay? Christians are divided between those who say that God values our free will and he honors it and protects it. And Christians who say God is omnipotent, he can do anything he wants, he does anything he wants. You're those who are saved are saved because God wills it. Those who are damned are damned because God wills it. It's a difficult proposition to, to wrestle with because I strongly believe that God can do anything. God is omnipotent. He can do anything. But I also believe that he wants a relationship of love with us. 
and there can be no genuine love without freedom and free choice. It's obvious that a judgment occurred before Jesus came, before Jesus returned. There has to be a judgment before his second coming because the righteous are resurrected at his second coming. So there's been a determination of who is, God has determined who's righteous and who's unrighteous already. So what is this about judgment and reigning during this thousand years? Well, I've heard this referred to as an investigative judgment. Okay? It's not about determining eternal consequences. It's about coming to grips with the messiness that is God's justice. See, judgment always, always involves Achman's razor, okay? A fine line. God gives those that he redeems a thousand years to learn to trust him implicitly by examining his actions and how he has dealt with those who have not been saved. Paul says that we have limited knowledge now. We know in part in his language. Okay? But then we will know even as we are known. We will know fully. Okay? Jesus said that nothing will be hidden not even the thoughts that we've hidden from ourselves. The final phase of judgment uh, comes in verses 11 and through 15, and this is when the consequences are handed out. So why is this complicated process required? Because God values our freedom to choose so much. Free will is an absolute necessity, a requirement for genuine love. And love is the foundational element of God's character and his relationship with his creation, his government, so to speak. And this is the touchstone that I'm trying to share with you today. Okay, Love freely given, without coercion, or manipulation is how God deals with us. And that is what God asks us to extend to each other. When Jesus said, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you love one another, this is what he was talking about. Love without coercion and without manipulation. Now last week I asserted that Christians find the calling of the church to be a pilgrim difficult to accept. We want permanence. We want security. We would rather be kings than pilgrims. This week I'm suggesting that any time that we use manipulation or coercion in any form to try to force love, respect, or unity of belief or action on other people, we are abandoning the principles of God's judgment and adopting those of Satan, the dragon of Revelation 12, who in Revelation 13 gives his power to the beasts. The mark of the beast is not a barcode or a chip or a number. It's thinking, the mark in our forehead, and acting, the mark in our hand, like the beast, which means acting like the dragon. This temptation to use Satan's methods of government is a powerful trap. It's very seductive to me. It's really easy for me to resort to shame,
consequences to try to manipulate people into doing what I want them to do, what I think is right. This was a real struggle for me as a parent. I had to learn that my children, not just my children, my wife had the right to free will. And it was not up to me as the father, husband, head of the household to use Satan's methods of force and coercion and manipulation of economic or emotional or physical to try to force their compliance with my will. Now, as a consequence, they made some decisions that I disagreed with. And that felt kind of powerless for me. But the other consequence is that as they have learned to trust me and my valuing of their freedom to choose, they have given me love freely and generously that frankly I never expected out of life. The relationships that I have with my wife and with my son and with my daughter are the most precious things in my life. I am constantly amazed at their generosity. But it comes as a direct result of me adopting Jesus' method of, of dealing with distrust and conflict. I hope you found something of value today, okay? This is really meaningful for me, which means it's really difficult for me to distance myself from it and just to wrap it up into a nice little ball with a bow on top, okay? Be safe, my friends. COVID's ramping up here again. It's raging around the, around the globe. Please be safe, be prudent, but above all, keep looking up. Thanks for joining me today. I hope to see you again next week.